like, well, disease, earthquake, all these things make God unhappy. What do you think? And finally they decided, you know what really makes God unhappy? There are a lot of people in this world who have nowhere to sleep at night. They sleep in cardboard boxes. They sleep under bridges. Ah, that's a good one. Well, I'll tell you what, Miller, why don't you go build a house for everybody who doesn't have a house? Everybody? Do you think God would be happy if anybody said, no, sir? Well, you better get started. <laughs> and Millard Fuller founded Habitat for Humanity. <laughs> and they haven't built a house yet for everybody in the world, but they've built 200,000 houses so far. I was in a radio station with Millard in Chicago. And he was on the air, call in show, and this woman called up, Jewish woman. She was furious. She said, I gave the Habitat for Humanity, and then I started getting all these mailings with all this Jesus talk. What is all this Jesus stuff? I don't believe in Jesus. I'm a Jew. And Millard said, Well, uh, of course, Jesus was a Jew too, ma'am. But he said, He said, Ma'am, you don't have to be a Christian to live in one of our houses and you don't have to be a Christian to help us build one of our houses but I gotta tell you ma'am the reason I get up every morning and most of my staff gets every morning and and do what we do is because we're trying to be like Jesus and we think Jesus wouldn't be happy if there's anybody who doesn't have a house so that's one of the last reasons why I believe simply because I've seen I've seen the gospel work out in the people I admire most C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if you read history, you will find out that the Christians who did the most for the present world, like a Millard Fuller, Paul Brand, were precisely those who thought the most of the next. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you get neither. Well, I've talked a long time and I did agree that we would have a question and answer period. So uh, you want to explain the rules here. Thank you very much for coming and for listening. And uh, we're going to go into that scary period where you can ask me, well, let's see, you can ask me almost any question. I was going to say not about the Iraq War. But I'll be glad to talk about the Iraq War. And probably not the ordination of gay bishops. I really don't want to talk about that tonight. <laughs> but most any other question, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, so much for sharing your heart and your life and even making us laugh a little bit. I appreciate that. Um, for the Q&A session, if you could keep your question, just one question per person, and I wasn't going to say keep it related to the topic, but he just said that you can pretty much talk on any topic you want. So That's right. um, just come up here and make sure you speak into the mic so we can hear you, and then just one question per person. Hello. Well, great, great job. Thank you. Um, I wrote a lot of notes. Are you okay. truly from Canada? Or are you just no, like I'm not, but I'm representing. You should okay. go. It's a very nice place. Yeah. Well, um, and, and not only that, for those of you who travel overseas, it wouldn't be a bad thing to put a Canadian flag on your backpack. <laughs> it's, that is the truth. That is the truth. Okay, well, I have just one quick statement and then one question. Uh, my statement was just about animals, and obviously there's no... Uh, we shouldn't, well, here's my statement. I wrote it down so I wouldn't uh, ramble, so I'm reading now. God did let us learn from the animals a little bit, I believe, is because no animal or cat or dog you've ever seen commit suicide. They don't self-inflict pain. I think that's something that, you know, they don't hold their breath forever. They, they don't even know how. Animals just be, and I think that's something that uh, God taught us that we can learn from. Um, okay, my question. I'm a Christian, and I'm really confused, and this has to do a little bit with the election, but I don't want to get into you know, specifics or anything, but the fact is, the more I think about becoming more like Jesus, I think about uh, giving all your money away, uh, like St. Francis, taking off all your clothes, you know, get, giving everything away, and going and follow Jesus. Um, and the more I think about that, I think about, what would Jesus do? The WWJD bracelets. I think about... Forgiving your enemies, loving your enemies, like you said, becoming Jesus is very complicated because you don't really want to love these people or forgive these people. I think about turning the other cheek. No revenge there. 
I think about don't throw the first stone. We don't we're not supposed to judge anybody. Um, but and the more more I think about it, the more I see as I don't want to put categorize labels on it, but I think of like a liberal perspective in the sense of forgiving and second chances and all that stuff, as opposed to the term that we know we hear, Christian conservative. Um, I think of myself as a Christian liberal, um, and I think, uh, and, and I'm confused, because when I look at the news, I, they don't exist. I think maybe Martin Luther King, maybe Jimmy Carter, I, I, I don't know, but Christian conservative is what I see everywhere, and I don't really identify with that. Um, so my question is, one is, I th it has to do with a little bit where you talk about the church, your own personal experience with the church, and sometimes that seems like a little bit more conservative, and now I'm rambling, I understand. So my question is, why is that, why, when I think of Jesus, is it not really what a Christian conservative is? It seems like to be, be a pretty big gap there from my point of view. And then also the question is, who would Jesus bomb? Who would Jesus what? Bomb. Bomb. So, that's kind of the... Anyway, I'm going to go sit down now. Yeah, I wrote in one of my books, sometimes I ask myself, what would I rather be, the most liberal person in a conservative room or the most conservative person in a liberal room? And more and more I feel like that's my only option. <laughs> Two options. Uh, a number of comments. Uh, first, I would say that the wedding of the religious right wing, the, the wedding of conservative politics and conservative theology, is, is fairly unique to America. If you go to the United Kingdom, if you go to Australia, and you go to New Zealand, the more conservative a person is theologically, wanting to follow the Bible, wanting to follow Jesus, the more likely they're going to be liberal politically. So the United States is kind of unique there. Uh, and that's true of most of Europe that I know of as well. Well, how did that happen? Well, uh, there are certain social issues that are very important to uh, Christians who try to be faithful to the Bible. Certainly abortion is one. Homosexuality is another. And... Uh, 30 years, when I was a child, or when I was a child, uh, even 30 years ago, like when McGovern, when George McGovern ran for president, his, his vice presidential candidate for a time was a man, senator named Thomas Eagleton, Democrat, liberal, but very strong pro-life. And that was fairly common. There were Democrats who were strongly pro-life, who were social conservatives. Democrats who were politically liberal, social conservatives. And in addition, there were Republicans who were who were anti-war, like Wayne Morse, like Mark Cadfield, uh, who, were cons who were liberal on, on certain issues. In, in the United States, I, you know, I don't know how it happened. You'll have to ask Karl Rove, I suppose. But in the United States, we've, we've really split. And the right wing has become totally allied with the, the conservative right, religious right, has become allied with the Republican Party, and there's not a lot of room for them. As you probably know, in the Democratic conventions, they will not allow a pro-life speaker to speak. And some of the issues that the religious right uh, thinks are important, I just shake my head at. You know, abolishing the Department of Education. What does, does Jesus want us to abolish the Department of Education? But that's important to the religious right. Uh, I'm not a politician. Some of you guys are political science majors. I would just say... Well, we, we were talking at dinner, and I said, isn't it interesting that the two issues that, that define a lot of evangelicals' interest in politics are abortion and gay rights? Both of those existed in a far more egregious form in Jesus' day. People in the Roman Empire didn't generally abort babies. They let them be born full term, and then they left them by the side of the road. It's called the abandonment of, of infants. And between a quarter and a third, historians estimate, of all babies born in the Roman Empire were just abandoned. And when the Christian church came along, they started taking some of those babies in. There was a whole platoon of wet nurses who, who nursed these babies, and, and they adopted them and kept them going. But 
Okay, abandonment of infants, far worse than abortion, because there's no question about, is this a human being? Of course it's a human being. It's born, it's been carried to term nine months, it's outside of the woman, it's a viable human being, and yet they let it die. And gay rights, uh, there, there weren't the kind of lifelong partnerships that, were being, that are being talked about today. It was usually older men having sexual relations with young boys, pederasty. That was pretty common in Greek culture and in Roman culture. Illegal in every state in the United States, I think every country in the world. So here are two forms of what is important to the religious right today. Abortion, but far worse, and uh, intergender relationships, but far worse, illegal today. And yet Jesus didn't say a word, not one word about either one of those. Isn't that interesting? That the two issues that, that evangelicals get most exercised about existed in Jesus' day in a far worse form, and he never even mentioned them. That seems a little strange to me. Now, he talked a lot about wealth, as you say. He talked a lot about enemies. He talked a lot about a lot of things. But he didn't talk about those things. So when I look at that, I think, huh. Am I following Jesus or am I following some kind of 21st century American little thing going on here? Now, I think both of those are important moral issues that I have to deal with, but they're not as important as some other issues that I have to deal with that were important to Jesus, evidently. So you rambled in your question. I rambled in my answer. We didn't solve anything. But next question. <laughs> You mentioned that you had experiences in your early church life that vaccinated you from the, the Bible. What advice would you give to people who have been through a similar situation or who have a loved one who have been through a similar situation? Hmm. Well, there are some people who probably should take a vacation from church. <laughs> um, and I think that's okay. Um, However, I think it's, it's, it's not a good long-term solution because it's very difficult for a person to maintain a spiritual warmth alone. The Christian life should, should come with one of these warnings. You know, do not practice alone <laughs> in your home. Um, I, I guess my, my advice would be to find a, a, a grace-filled place, could be just a small group, could be a group of friends, where you're rewarded for honesty, not punished for honesty. Uh, Jesus was that kind of person, and I think the church should be that kind of institution. It, it often is not. A lot of people, the last place they would think of being honest is in a church. But I, I have been fortunate enough, graced enough, to find churches where, where I could just say, even as a teacher, man, I read this passage and I... I'm really struggling here. I have a hard time even believing this. And I know I'm not really living up to it. And I wouldn't be kicked out of the church for saying that. And, and um, increasingly, you know, certainly compared to the childhood church I grew up in, and there, there are options. There are grace-filled places around. When I look for a church, I look for a place of, of diversity. You look at the Pharisees. What was wrong with the Pharisees? The Pharisees were very upright, outstanding citizens. The basic problem with the Pharisees, as I study them, is that they hung around other Pharisees all day. <laughs> if, if, instead of just being around Pharisees, if they'd been with some of those tax collectors and prostitutes and di different people, they wouldn't have such a neat little view of the world. <laughs> and so I look for a church that has that kind of diversity. And uh, I look for a church that, that does it. One of the most moving scenes of the Gospels to me is after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Jesus only appeared to groups of people, groups of people who already believed in him. Isn't that interesting? That, that proves that Jesus was not an American. Uh, you know, if I, if I were Jesus, if I were Jesus, and I was raised from the dead, you know where I'd be Monday morning? Pilate's porch. I'm back! <laughs>